Welcome to How Brands Are Built, where branding professionals get into the details of what they do and how they do it. I'm your host, Rob Meyerson. Thanks for listening. Today's episode is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. Last episode featured Brian Collins, Chief Creative Officer of Collins, an independent strategy and brand experience design company. As I mentioned in that episode, the person who originally put me in touch with Brian was Diego Segura, a design apprentice at Collins. Diego reached out in response to a call I put out on social media for interviewees who could speak to diversity and inclusion in the agency world. He suggested I learn about the internship program at Collins, which focuses on high school students of color. So in the last episode, Brian talked about the impetus for the internship program and how it's going now. If you haven't listened already, I suggest you go back and check it out. But today, I wanted to get Diego's story. Diego is a designer and writer. He's written two books, To a Man Much Like Myself and The Dropout Manifesto. In case you're wondering about that second title, yes, Diego is a high school dropout, and instead of going to college, he's doing his apprenticeship at Collins. In today's conversation, I'll ask him all about his personal story, as well as his point of view on how the design and branding world can be more inclusive. But first, here's a short clip of Brian to provide some context for the conversation with Diego. You know, Rob, it's so interesting to me that the number of young designers who are fluent who start looking at this career in junior high school or even high school. And because of the transparency and the ease of the interfaces of so many of the design programs and systems, so many young people teach themselves. And because there's so many good tutorials, whether it's from any of the brands, whether it's Figma, which is, you know, uh, which is incredible, Adobe, um, any of the software tools that people use, the students and high school students and even junior high school students are teaching them all of these, all of these skills. So we've oddly become, because probably because of our, our work with Twitch and, and Spotify, we're, we seem to be well known to high school students who want to pursue a career in design. So we got a phone call and an email from, we get scores of them actually from those who want to know about how, you, how do you start a career in design? And Diego's was, was particularly interesting because he'd sent you know, a, a video. And it was a long video. It might have been like 20 or 15 minutes. And I said, I'm not going to look at a 15 or 20 minute video. Send me, send me one that's less than five minutes. <laughs> and, and two days later, I got an edited five minute video from Diego Segura. He was a high school student who's the child of an immigrant parent from Mexico. He, he grew up near Austin. And he was fascinated by design board by high school. And he wanted to work with us that summer as, as an intern. So I said to him, well, when you're in New York sometime, you know, I'd be very happy to meet you, to, to consider you for, for our internship program. So, you know, I thinking that would be, be the end of it because I really could only work with interns who are, who are either in San Francisco or in New York. I got a phone call, like on a Friday. They said, Brian, yeah, um, are you open this afternoon? Like, what do you mean? I'm in New York. He saved up his money and he brought his mother and they flew to New York. He, wow. he saved up his money. He works after school. Like he works after school. He does like some freelance work. He put his money away and he flew. He and his mother, he was 17. He flew to New York and he waited in my lobby until I had time to meet with him. He waited all, me, all <laughs> afternoon, assertive. And <laughs> I said, work, okay, yes. I came out with meet him and it was a very nice meeting. He showed me his book. He'd written this book called The Dropout Manifesto. He was self-published. I look at his work and for a high school student, I think he was doing second year college student design work. Easily, easily second year college design. I'm like, well, and he was 17. I'm like, well, all right. And I said, this is really interesting. Let me think about it. This is still the spring. He said, thank you very much. It was nice meeting you. And I, I let it go. And he called me up and he said, well, are we going to make this happen? I said, yes. And he said, okay, well, let me think about it. And so he, he said, are you going to be around next week? And I said, yes. He, he came back to New York and he said, are you free today? I said, what, can I come and talk with you? Yeah, I, I, he just showed up again in New York City on a Saturday. I said, sure, I'll make some time. And I wanted to know exactly how serious this kid was. So I did what I sometimes do with someone is I do errands in New York on a Saturday. I just walk around, I go to bookstores, I'll, I'll go to a store, I'll go shopping. I said, this is what I do on a Saturday. Do you want to join me? And he said, sure. I basically walked around New York City with him. He just hung out with me all day long as I went to bookstores, shopping, got some food, we had dinner, we bumped into friends that I knew. At the end of that day, he put up with everything. And then I brought him back to the team. He interviewed with all the creative directors 
and your Casa La Chapelle, and he said, this kid should be an intern. So uh, he came to New York, uh, he got himself an apartment, and he was an intern that summer at Collins, just as he turned 18. That's great. Yeah. And then he was so good, um, he did not want to go to college. And so we extended the internship into an apprenticeship. He so over delivered and so worked so hard. The other members of our team really liked him, and we made him a full time employee at the beginning of last year. So he started in January of 2020 as a full time associate designer as part of our apprenticeship program. And he has, he has stuff he has to do, he has stuff he has to read, he has stuff he has to write. But you know, if you've seen the redesign of Medium, you've seen his work. Wow. At 18 years old. Yeah. So um, now he, he also did that with the other members um, of, sure. uh, of the team who were just like remarkable and uh, um, George Lavender and uh, Nick Ace who led that team welcomed him into that work. And so I think we've had a, we've had a good opportunity to, to create a space for, for young people to kind of uh, work together. Well, that's great. And I'm looking forward to, to talking to Diego and, and hearing about his personal story and his experience. With yeah, Tom. I think it was, it, was, it was good, you know, and I think Diego's life has changed. He was you know, a high school student a year and a half ago in Austin. Now he's an associate designer and he has an apartment in Brooklyn. Now that you've heard that little intro from Brian, here's Diego Segura, design apprentice at Collins. Diego, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate you having me. So we just talked to Brian, um, and I heard from his perspective a lot about uh, Collins, and he talked a little bit about you. Um, but I'd love to hear just from, from your point of view, can you start by telling us just a little bit about yourself, your background, um, your design experience, and, and so on? Yeah, for sure. So I'm Diego. I'm the uh, apprentice currently at Collins. Um, I'm from Austin, Texas, a about 30 minutes outside of the city, a relatively small suburb outside of Austin called Leander, Texas. So uh, needless to say, it is um, the furthest away you could possibly get from the uh, high design brand you know, world that is New York City. Yeah. Um, and so that was my background. Um, the backdrop through which I kind of learned about design was you know, in the suburbs, just going to school pretty normal life. But then I kind of discovered design, you know, through the internet and YouTube and, and started to teach myself. And one thing led to another and I've ended up here doing this apprenticeship and it's been pretty fantastic. So did you, you said you started to learn about design um, when you were living in Texas. Did you take design classes and, and, you know, growing up or in high school or anything like that? Or was it really through your own research online? No classes, no formal training. Um, it, it's uh, funny that you ask. I've I've revisited this introduction to graphic design, and it's actually one of the questions I really love to ask other graphic designers mm -hmm. or creatives in general. Is how did you discover the thing that you do? And I think uh, graphic design is, is an oddly specific skill set. Photography, every family had a camera, and so... You, you probably were exposed to a camera as a young person um, and took a specific liking to it. Uh, or maybe the game of chess, you had a chess board at your family home. Uh, graphic design is, is not something that you naturally run into on a Saturday night. But as a kid, the way I ran into graphic design was uh, actually because I hung out on these hacking forums <laughs> because as a third grader, I wanted to be you know some sort of programmer, developer, hacker, uh, I was just fascinated with computers and on these hacking forums, they always had graphic design sections. And I'm not sure exactly what the overlap was between selling illegal credit cards and <laughs> graphic design. Well, you got to be able to design a realistic looking credit card, right? <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. I'm sure some of these guys are doing fake IDs and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, so through that, I started to see these really cool, you know, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, you know, being on message boards and people had their little signatures at the bottom of the messages. Yeah. And people would make all these custom, like, you know, little banners that they put down with their, with their cool usernames. And it was all matrix looking because they were on hacking forums and wanted to look like the most elite, uh, you know, programmer 
in the community. And so that was kind of my introduction to graphic design. And so sure enough, I started making banners for these people on the forums. They were awful. They were awful. <laughs> Cheesy. I was using just Defont and, you know, whatever free fonts I could find on the internet. It was awful. But it was really, really fun. I used to make myself a new forum banner every couple days. And it was fascinating to me. And I'd gotten started with GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program, free uh-huh. as free as can be. And that that was my start. And I didn't take it too seriously. It's not that I learned about graphic design per se. I just knew I wanted to make these forum banners. And I knew I wanted to make, uh, you know, little logos for myself. And I used to yeah. play video games. And we'd have me and my friends would make a team and we would uh, I would design a logo for the team and we, you know, it was all uh, kind of branding from a young age, but I didn't take it too seriously at that point. But at least that was an introduction that um, later on when I did kindle an interest in graphic design, I kind of knew where to start. Right. I, I mean, I'm sure you didn't know, you probably didn't have the terminology to, to call it uh, graphic design or branding and, and maybe didn't know that it, you could even do that for a living. But that then once you saw it, I assume it all kind of clicked like, Oh, this, this is what I want to do. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and quickly I can touch on the, you know, when that clicked. Yeah. It clicked later on when I did my first internship, uh, it was really just a summer job at a home builder in Austin, Texas. And I got to work in the office. I was 16 years old. Mind you, the introduction to all these hacking forums and graphic design, I was probably 10, 11 years old, uh-huh. um, scouring the internet, uninhibited by any privacy, you know, parental restrictions, um, you know, for, for, for better and for worse. And at 16, I did this internship and I was working on spreadsheets, Rob. It was, it was awful. I was plugging in numbers and just exporting things over. I'd written some programs in Python to, to make the work faster. And so I had quite a bit of free time by the end of my internship because I'd automated most of the ant- antiquated process. And then I remembered that I loved graphic design and there was some sort of t-shirt somebody was making. They wanted to do a t-shirt. And so I kind of jumped on the opportunity to, to mock up some versions of this t-shirt and people thought it was really cool. And I don't have the files anymore. I'm sure it was awful That's too. Bad. <laughs> too. But I was uh, more aware of kind of the business world. I knew what a freelancer was. I knew what, uh, you know, I knew what it meant to actually make money at that point. That summer, I'd also bought myself a new laptop from my money doing that, that summer job. And so it was at that point when it clicked that, like you said, I, I started to put this skill that I had kind of used on and off over the years to make random cool stuff for myself Mm -hmm. and really say, well, Hey, I could actually make some money. And if I made, you know, $500 doing a logo, that's awesome. And I could do that in school, uh, you know, while still in high school, uh, of course the school didn't last long, but that's, that's another (laughs) tangent. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. Cause I, what I, what I'd love to know is how you got from small town, Texas to New York city and, and Collins. Um, and I understand you, you didn't go to college, but I'm not sure sort of what the decision-making process was. Did you move to New York without a job just to experience New York or did you find out about Collins and that's what brought you to New York? How how did that um, connection happen? Sure. The bullet point version is this. Didn't go to college, didn't finish high school properly. Um, (laughs) So I, after that, I guess it kind of starts at that internship. I went back to school, high school for my junior year, uh, 17 years old. I'm, I've realized that I could possibly hone this design skill set and make some money. And I think within a couple months, I did get somebody to pay me to do a logo. And I made like 500 bucks and it became very real when you get your first little paycheck from uh, doing design. And so that year, I remember distinctly walking into my art teacher, uh, my into my art teacher's classroom. I was very quick to go grab a marker and go to the whiteboard. I, I said, Miss Kaysen, come here. I'm going to show you my plan. I'm going to be a graphic designer by the end of the year, and I'm not going to go to my senior year of high school. And she said, what? Of course you're going to do. You're going to graduate. You're not going to, you know, but I mean, yeah, I want you to do cool things, but you're going to graduate. I said, no, 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 Miss Kaysen. Here's what's going to happen. And so I wrote up on the board. I wrote uh, three bullet points. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was 
theory, practice, and portfolio. Very McKinseyite uh, way uh-huh. of explaining, you know, but mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. I was, I don't know why I was so structured about this, but I said, I, I'm going to learn the theory of design. I'm going to go get books. I'm going to go read on the internet. I'm going to learn about composition and all these art terms that she had been teaching us about. I'm going to practice, of course, every day. I'm going to do a logo a day for X amount of days and portfolio. I'm going to turn the theory and the practice into something tangible that I can show companies in the area. Yeah. And so that was my threefold uh, plan to, to get a graphic design internship by the next year. And of course, the part that is grossly left out of that is probably the most key, which is networking. Mm. I'm 17 years old in Leander, Texas. <laughs> Trust me, there are no hyper talented uh, brand designers, the likes of the people at Collins, Pentagram, Mother. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they're just not in Leander, Texas. And so the the other you know big prong of that was I had to reach out to people in Austin, and luckily I was near you know a major right. city like Austin, yeah, known for creativity and design, a hundred percent. And so I was close enough to it that I started e cold emailing everybody, everybody, everybody. I emailed founders, CEOs. There's a place called the Capital Factory in Austin, which is just startups on startups, and. I started to get in touch with them. I remember this one guy invited me down to the Capital Factory. He spent like a whole day with me, show, introducing me to different founders. He took me to t- some tech stars uh, event. I, of course, I wasn't old enough to drink, so they gave me a drink <laughs> ticket. And then here I am, standing next to the guy who invented Ethernet or something. I, I forget. It was crazy, <laughs> but I was just networking and networking. And, just, and of course, every time I used my age, I said, "I'm 17 years old. This is what I'm trying to do," and yeah. everybody loved it right? It's Austin. It's very forward thinking. Um, so I did that. And I even remember I went to the Pentagram office. They have an office in Austin. Yep. They okay. do. DJ Scout runs the office. And I, I drove up there and I just showed up cold and just knocked on the door. And that office manager looked me up and down and said, get the hell out of here. Like, <laughs> what, you, do you have an appointment? Yeah. And I said, no, I don't have an appointment. I was just wondering if somebody, you know, Wanted to uh, wanted to help me out, you know, maybe tell me a little bit about design. I had no idea of any of these things. Rob, she shooed me away so quickly. But at one point, I got a little bit more ambitious. And he, the wonderful part of that is that it wasn't a year later that I had kind of skipped the ladder. I wasn't reaching out to office managers. I was reaching out to whoever's email I could find, and I reached out to Michael Beirut. Uh huh. Michael Beirut returned many of my emails. Wow. And then finally I said, can you introduce me to DJ, to DJ Stout in Austin? Yeah. He gave me DJ's email. I emailed DJ and all of a sudden a year later I had an appointment. <laughs> and the same office manager, I said, do you remember me? Last year I showed up cold and you shooed me away, but now I have an appointment. She said, no shit. She remembered the day. <laughs> she knew exactly what it was. She said, no shit. I can't believe it. That is just wild. So... <laughs> That was really the the important part of, you know, I had all these things, you know, working for me as far as teaching myself design, but inevitably I needed a network. Right. And so ultimately how I got out of school and didn't return to my senior year was this. I had written a book, someone I had met at some entrepreneurial meetup of some sort in the area. He had mentioned how easy it was to self-publish books on Amazon now and how you could write them and get a copywriter and hire an editor. And I wrote most of mine myself and then I hired an editor okay. to, um, to work on it with me. And I wrote the dropout manifesto, which was my manifesto about why I wasn't gonna go to college, let alone high school, but really it was just a book about, here's what I'm doing to educate myself and I'm making incredible progress that I wouldn't be making if I was focusing on my biology assignments right now. Mm-hmm. Because personally, I don't care about that. This is what I'm trying to go do, and this is how I'm going to do it. And I wrote about how I was reaching out to these people, how I would find these people's emails. It was just a chronicle of that uh, of that kind of crazy junior year. Okay. And one of the people I reached out to was David Self, a wonderful founder in Austin, Texas, and he gave me my first job. I worked there for four months as a designer and a copywriter in Austin, right on 6th Street. and. Uh, yeah, from there, I, I did another remote internship, and then I reached out to Brian Collins the same way I reached out to everybody and kind of sold him on the idea of bringing me to Collins for an apprenticeship. Wow, wow. 
This episode of How Brands Are Built is brought to you by Squad Help, the world's number one naming platform. Here's how Squad Help works. You launch a naming contest to engage hundreds of naming experts. You're guided through an agency-level naming process that goes beyond traditional crowdsourcing. The platform uses AI and includes name validation features such as audience testing, trademark validation, linguistic analysis, and quality scoring. And Squad Help doesn't just do naming. You can also use their platform for taglines or slogans, as well as logo design. To launch your naming contest today, go to squadhelp.com and start receiving custom name suggestions instantly. Squad Help, company, brand, and business name ideas by experts. So in brief, what, what was behind the decision? You know, what was the, uh, the rush, I suppose, to do this your junior year as opposed to finishing high school and then doing it? Did, did you just really feel that high school was not worth your time? And so why not start now? Or was there something else motivating that? Yeah, it was it really was uh, dead simple that I, I felt like I would be wasting my time horribly. Um <laughs> I always felt like I was wasting my time at school. Yeah. That's not to say that I didn't have some fantastically influential teachers, some really smart ones. Um, one of my favorite teachers, Mr. Hunt, shout out if you're listening, one of the most incredibly intelligent people I'd ever met in my entire life. He was a debate teacher of mine. And so it was great in that respect. But at the same time, when I was networking, and I say networking loosely, I hate the term, but I was reaching out to people, saying hello, asking them questions, and I was meeting more fascinating people day to day. Yeah. Rob, I would show up to class at 9 a.m., and at 9.30, I'd have something on the calendar, and so I'd just <laughs> walk out of class and take a call, and I wish I could find some screenshots of my calendar. I'm sitting, I'm a high school student, I should be doing my homework, and I literally have four, five, six meetings a day with founders, Anybody I could get in, you know, CMOs, marketing directors, design directors, typographer, anybody, anywhere, they would take little 15 minute calls with me and I'd ask them, how did you get into design? How'd you do this? What would you recommend? How should I do my portfolio? Ask all sorts of questions. Five, six calls a day. It was insane. Wow. And my teachers, luckily, most of them uh, were pretty supportive. They didn't ask a lot of questions, I think, because if you have the audacity to walk out and just have the phone to your ear, people think it's really important. Um, <laughs> for me, of course, it was, right. uh, though surely it wasn't an emergency. Let's talk about getting to Collins. So you said you reached yeah. out to Brian Collins. I assume you maybe reached out to other to others at the same time. Uh, and yep. Brian was one of the ones that responded and maybe one of the ones you were most interested in. Um, for sure. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like starting out at Collins and sort of why you think, whether it's an apprenticeship program or an internship program, why programs like this are important and, and useful. For sure. So first of all, uh, you know, what was the start? Um, so again, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than in, in high school internship because the high school internship is, um, has a really very simple and beautiful goal, which is to bring young people who are interested in art and maybe showing promise in art um, or graphic design or any any sort of uh, creative endeavor, and then bringing them into a real creative studio and showing them uh, the world as it is in in you know creative professions. So, for example, Safia and Caesar, who were uh, high school interns at the same time that I had started my apprenticeship. Caesar was working on all sorts of crazy illustration, beautiful art. Um, and he very much was unaware of the world of graphic design as I know it, for mm -hmm. example. Of course, I had entered it through, um, you know, reaching out to these people and learning more about all the studios. I knew Pentagram and, and, and Walsh, you know, Sagmeister and Walsh, mm -hmm. you know, before they were and Walsh. I knew all about that. And so I kind of took it for granted that I understood the professional space of the design world. And for example, Safi and Caesar were just a little less aware of that because they hadn't been exposed to it. It's, it's not if through any fault of their own, right? It's just they hadn't been exposed to that. And so the goal of that internship is to bring them in and expose them to everything we can find 
uh, for them, which is, you know, having them shadowing client meetings and having them learn about different studios and different designers and every designer in the room mentors those interns and it's fantastic. It's amazing. Yeah. That said, my start was a little different simply because one, it had never been done before, but two, nobody exactly knew what to expect. So I had a portfolio, but it surely wasn't of the quality of some of the young people that Collins has hired in the past. I was able to perform work and do InDesign and Illustrator and Photoshop. I didn't need any training per se there. Though at the same time, it was un I mean, everybody was unsure of exactly what I could do or what I could handle. Again, because I hadn't gone to school, right? I didn't have a true portfolio. I hadn't been guided by any sort of professors on this is what you should show in your portfolio. This is how you should do it. I very much sold my way in and said, take a chance. I'll figure it out as I go. And if you think I'm capable of that, then it'll all work out. And so my start was uh, the first week I just shadowed in different meetings. I followed Tom around and I would listen to any client call that he was on and listen to him present work and see the work that they were presenting. And then the wonderful, incredibly talented Leo Porto took some time to let me kind of look over his shoulder and see what he was working on. And at one point, he, he was teaching me, you know, these little tricks and shortcuts. And he was like, do you know that one already? I was like, yeah, yeah, I've done that before. And a couple more like that where he would kind of gut check and say, you already know this, don't you? And I was like, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I'm not saying I know it, but I mean, I'm aware. And so I've looked back at my calendar from those days and I realized that it was about two weeks in, which I never would have expected. But it was about two weeks in before Leo was putting himself in my calendar and handing me, you know, a brain guidelines he was working on said, you do it. Yeah. I, I remember telling Trial Leo, like, I, yeah, I, said, I don't know how to do that. I've never done a brain guidelines. He goes, yeah, but let's be honest. You can do it. You know, he, he was, he believed in me way more than I believed in myself. <laughs> so my start was Leo handing me these things and saying, well, just go for it. You'll be fine. Don't, yeah. don't worry about it. Just, you know, go for it. And then of course he would critique the work and come by and take a look at it and we'd make edits. And then I started to learn by seeing how he would make edits. And so, yeah, it was very much trial by fire. And then hmm. the more Leo gave me, the more I got to do. And the more he trusted me with the work that turned into, you know, working on a packaging project that he was on for many months. And then I ended up doing a lot of that even after he wasn't on the project anymore. So the key to the start as an apprentice, when nobody knows exactly what you're capable of and, Frankly, I didn't know what I could do. That's why I doubted myself so much when Leo handed me simple tasks. And that's not to say I was running an entire design team or a design system by any means. But it was just that little belief that Leo said, well, here, take this one small task and do that and then do a slightly bigger one, so on and so forth. And very soon it, it turned into late nights at the office just like anybody else. Yeah. It, it really speaks volumes of Collins that they were able to, frankly, take a risk on you. I mean, in your own words, they sort of didn't know what to make of you. You, you didn't have, uh, you hadn't gone to design school. They couldn't get references from design professors that you had had. Um, they'd seen your portfolio, but you know they didn't know what you were capable of. It sounds like you didn't even know what you were capable of at the time. I, I'm just wondering, is is a big part of these internships or maybe more specifically what, what Collins has done with you just, is it changing the design industry? And this was something that, that Brian spoke to a bit in that it's bringing less traditionally trained people in and frankly, maybe bringing uh, more diversity to the industry, even from a age, gender and racial standpoint, because it's not relying on that, very traditional avenue of you go to high school, you graduate, you go to design school, you graduate, then you get an internship at a, or, or, you know, your first job at a design studio. Yeah, for sure. Well, and this, and this gets back to your question on like, why is an apprenticeship like this important? And the simple answers for me is this, and this is from personal experience. I had no idea at 16, 17 years old, what SVA was, hmm. RISD, Art Center, I had no idea. Parsons, these were not on my radar. 
Yeah. The only thing that was on my radar was the guidance counselor saying, hey, you have pretty good grades. You could get into a lot of great schools and you're automatically accepted into UT, you know, all that stuff. The standard college stuff uh, coming out of high school. I had no idea that these things were available. So it's funny that when I was out of high school for a year already joining Collins, people said, well, why didn't you go to art school? I said, to be completely frank, I made my dropout decision before I knew any of those things existed. I didn't right. know you could go to school really for design, which sounds stupid, but it just wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it. Yeah. And so when you look at the broader industry, I would venture to guess that the people who get into design somehow were made aware of it. And well, obviously they were made aware of it at one point. And I would guess that a lot of lower income high schools, for example, the high school I went to was the lowest income in our district. We weren't made aware of those things at maybe as much as we could have been or should have been. And so it's a clear discrepancy between going to a wealthy school where, oh, yeah, my, you know, my friend is the director of marketing. You know, my friend's mom is the director of marketing at some massive corporation. And so they're aware of that. Right. And so what you end up with is, of course, the, the ideal uh, thing is that we reform, you know, K-12 education in a lot of ways. That's kind of where I stand on, you know, we need to do a better job of, you know, preparing people for uh, the real world, but also giving them a, a truly holistic education. That's why sure. I'd always felt like I was wasting my time at school. Yeah. But on more, the other more end, a long-term solution though, right? <laughs> it's yeah, not going to happen. Exactly. Overnight. That's a much more long-term solution. The short-term solution is this, the people who didn't discover design when they were in high school making a decision about college, a lot of them skill, still discovered it somehow. And so I get a lot of people reaching out to me via email who find me on the Collins website and say, you're a design apprentice. I would love that. That sounds like my ideal role. And I always ask them, well, how did you discover design? A lot of them had no idea until 22, 23, they met somebody who went to design school and now they wanted to do it. And it turns out they're teaching themselves and getting really, really good, Rob, really, yeah. really good. And they're not doing it by paying a lot of money for design school. They're doing it by teaching themselves, meeting other designers, getting better, getting critiques. It's pretty insane how much better you can get at graphic design, uh, you know, from scratch. Right. And, and for, for free. For free, exactly. Or, or, or relatively cheap, yeah. It, it's right. interesting. I mean, I, I've had a very similar experience, I suppose. I, I mean, my, my trajectory was very different than yours, but and I'm not a designer. But just in, in the fact that, I had no idea that branding was a thing. And most right. brand strategists that I've met uh, throughout my career, almost, it's, you know, it's almost to a, to a person, they quote unquote fell into it. Um, you know, they, yep. they were trying, they were shooting for something else and just kind of somehow got bumped off that path into brand strategy and f thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is what I really want to do. And had I only known it existed. Uh, now, maybe that's less and less common. Um, right. these days. But, um, but yeah, I think the, a point that I've made many times is just that I think what I wish I had known, um, growing up was just the incredible diversity of occupations out there. You know, I, I think yep. I, I really, you know, even children's books, you know, they say you can be all these things, but it's always the same 30 things, right? It's like, you can be a, a mm -hmm. A uh, postal worker, or a teacher, or uh, you know, a fireman, or uh, right. a scientist, quote unquote. But w even within each of those, there's a thousand shades of what it means to be that kind of to be in that uh, that world. And so, I, I think um, you know, just like you say, designer. I mean, designer is is what like five thousand different jobs probably. Um, so I think knowing that sooner would be really useful. Hundred percent undoubtedly I had an advantage by figuring something out that I wanted to do young. Mm -hmm. Collins was small enough where Brian still had the time to personally champion a young person who he thought would be a good apprentice through the organization. And if it wasn't for that, it would have been a problem. Collins was also big enough that they weren't a tiny studio where they can't really afford to take a risk like that. So it was kind of the, the perfect organization to test pilot something like this. And of course, after six months, I you know, was able to, to work on some of these projects and I would say provide a lot of value. Again, I'm significantly younger than all the other designers. So 
by all means, I lack experience. I, I would never in a million years claim that I am as good as some of the people I work with. These are the most talented designers I've ever met, and I've met a lot of designers. So there's that challenge. But at the same time, I've been able to provide value. And so the message then is for all those studios, smaller studios, or even larger ones, that you get someone reaching out to you, a young kid who's, and when I say young kid, that doesn't even mean a kid per se. That just means someone who's trying to break into the design scene and do really good work. And they email me all the time. And I know they email Brian all the time. You can say, well, you need to work on your portfolio and you need to do this and you need to do that. But the reality is we need to have more conversations with those people and say, wait a second, there's some real promise here because we've seen it happen at such and such agency. Well, Collins did it and they, they got these interns and apprentices and people in the high school internship program are now graduating from design school and have really badass portfolios. So they're home growing talent from the r- random suburbs in Texas. <laughs> Why do we have to pay somebody, you know, crazy top dollar because they went to a famous school like, you know, the SVA, the RISD, not to say that it's, it's about, you know, money or economics per se, but it's, you can take a bet on somebody who maybe has less credentials. And I, I'm telling you now, if I was out to start a studio today, I would practically build it solely on young, ambitious people led by a really great uh, creative director, head of design, yeah. because the level of talent who reaches out to me personally, because they see I'm the design apprentice on the website, the level of talent is insane. They are so, so, so good. I constantly question myself and say, geez, why don't they have the apprenticeship? Right? <laughs> These people are talented. There's no doubt they can add value. It's just they didn't come from the same places that all the other designers came from. And we've got to be OK with that. Do you think it's important? Uh, you know, you just gave some advice, uh, I suppose, to design studios, um, like you said, big and small to be a little more open-minded, do you think it's important that they create formal uh, internship programs or apprenticeship programs, or is it more just that mindset shift? How would you weight those two things? I would imagine, and I'm not a studio owner myself, but I would imagine it depends on the size of the organization. Mm. Collins was able to do this in a more organized way because they're a little bit larger, not huge, but a little bit larger, there's more people involved, there's formal HR department, there's, you know, there's more structure in general at Collins. And so for Collins to put it in the structure, it shows we are being hyper intentional about it. And we're doing it very much so on purpose, which if you have the ability to do that, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, it's an incredible value creation uh, technique, if you want to put it that way. It's also just an ethically good thing to do is to institutionalize, you know, bringing people into the fold who may otherwise not be there. That said, at a smaller studio, it is about the attitude, like you mentioned. It's less about the formal, you know, whatever you call it. You don't have to put a logo to your apprenticeship program. But it is whoever's in charge of hiring, or whoever's in charge of recruiting, it, it really is just a mindset change. And as subtle as that might seem, you might not get credit for it per se in the way that Collins is right now. Yocasta has been able to get uh, many you know, speaking arrangements and, and do these things to kind of spread the gospel of uh, doing more internships and apprenticeships and bringing more people into the fold who otherwise wouldn't be in design. And that's great. And of course, Collins has a brand that people know and love. For the small students, you might not get any credit for it, but hopefully you wouldn't just want to bring in you know, people of color or People like me who come from immigrant parents. Uh, my dad is immigrated to this country from Mexico. Yeah, I would hope you don't do it so that you can say, oh, we have an immigrant child here. <laughs> I would hope you do it because there's a yeah. genuine want in your organization to have different people around. No, that's that's good advice. No, don't, don't do it just for the credit. And, I, you know, I've talked to other people, and I, I think this came up with Brian as well, um, the importance of of diversity is is more than just uh, getting credit for it, um, and it's 100%. it's more than just doing the right thing. It's uh, there, there are real business benefits, and I think that's becoming more and more clear over time. You gave some advice to studios. What's your advice to people that are listening to this that maybe are in high school or college and they're hearing what you did and thinking that sounds pretty amazing? Uh, you know, it's, it seems like 
things have gone well for you, and, and I'm, I'm sure you're very happy with where you are now at Collins, but if you had to do it over again, is there anything you would do differently, um, or is there any piece of advice that you haven't already mentioned that you think people need to know in order to try to pursue doing something similar to what you've done? Well, two things. One is reach out. Two is see the whole board. So I'll cover these quickly. One on reaching out, the number one thing more than all the theory, practice, and portfolio work that I did uh, you know, from my whiteboard sketch with Ms. Kaysen, <laughs> it was reaching out to people, meeting them, expressing what I was ambitious about, and asking for more you know, meetings for other people that they knew. Because it turns out when you meet people and connect with people, they are also connected to people. Fascinating. And so that is the number one thing is if you're, you know, learning discord, if you're on a discord channel for designers, or if you're on some designing forum or learning on YouTube, that's awesome. But reach out to people, make a lot of friends uh, and leave a good impression on these people because you never know. It might be in five years uh, or in 10 years even, or it might be in six months, you might get your first internship or they might know somebody who has an internship opening and can make an introduction. That's really what made the difference for me. So that's one piece of advice. The second piece of advice, though, is to see the whole board. And what I mean is, in chess, if you're only paying attention to one side of the board, you'll get checkmated on the other, uh, which happens very often for amateur players is they will you know, try to attack on one side and then completely lose on the other. And I think the same thing goes for when you're chasing something in your career. I was very tunnel visioned about Collins, but that was after having my eyes wide open to the wide world of possibilities in design. I spent months and months and months talking to typographers, talking to product designers, talking to brand designers, talking to marketers and copywriters, talking to creative directors. I spoke to a lot of different people in design before I saw Collins, reached out, got a response and really set my sights on it. Hmm. And so I do have some people reach out to me specifically because they want to work at Collins. And I say, you should. It's wonderful to work at Collins. That said, sometimes they, have, they don't know exactly why Collins specifically. And then I look at their portfolio and I say, well, wait a second. You love Collins, but you're a filmmaker. We, we're a brand design firm. Of course, we do film sometimes. And we do some amazing experiential design. And there's more to it. But you're a filmmaker. Is there a way that you could lean into that love? Sure, you can admire Collins, but I know this studio, so-and-so, or this person who's a filmmaker who I met in New York City, you should talk to them. And then they say, you know, you're right. I love film. Or they love photography. Or they actually love product design. Or they have a real interest in software engineering and they want to blend, you know, software and product design. And so when I say see the whole board, if you see a company like Collins, and you're just tunnel visioned on them, either you know for sure, or you do need to step back and like, let everything open up. Because the fact is, Collins is a team of about 50 people. There's only so many people that can work at Collins. And there's only so many people who can work at Ann Walsh. And there's only so many people who can work on a team at Pentagram. Yeah. And we can we can you know cry until the cows come home that we need to include more people but in the end there's also a numbers thing which is you know collins can't hire people endlessly i'm sure there have been many people brian wanted to hire that he said well we can't do that because we can't have a staff of 500 people when we don't have work for 500 people or money for 500 people right. there's so many talented people and so that is you know people meet me and say well you made it to collins it's possible i say yeah but i also recognize that i was incredibly lucky that brian happened to be very open to that. And it was feasible to do that at that point. If not, you, you just got to open up your eyes because I, I can almost guarantee you wherever you go, even if you go to some place where they do poor work for your first internship and you feel like they're not as good as, you know, all the best agencies in New York City or they're a hometown kind of advertising or marketing agency, I guarantee you're going to learn a whole lot from that internship. Get your first thing, go do it, and then go through all the doors that open. Uh, trust me, you can always walk back out of them and, and reassess <laughs> the landscape. It doesn't have to be so. Uh, you know, it's just like when kids apply to colleges and they don't get a, they don't get into the one college they wanted to go to. 
It's like there's a million colleges. Yeah. You, you'll find one. Don't worry about it. Just go to that one, learn what you need to learn, and then keep, keep going. Yeah. Great advice. So the only thing I'd, I'd like to end on is just what are your plans? Like what do you see in your in your future? Uh, you, you mentioned if you were to start your own studio, do you think that's something that might happen? Or, or what else uh, do you do you hope to do? Yeah, so it might happen, you know, running my own studio. It, it might happen that I go freelance for a couple of years. It might happen that I stay at Collins uh, until I'm 85 years old. <laughs> it, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of possibilities. And I think, you know, it actually connects to the answer I just gave on kind of going through the doors that open. Mm-hmm. Uh, a great quote that I love is, and I, I don't remember who said it, don't remember where I heard it, but the quote is, the next opportunity is the one you have now. And at Collins, uh, I always wanted this opportunity to be here. And of course, I could constantly be thinking about, well, how am I going to advance in the organization? How do I ladder my way up to you know, design director and creative director? And how do I earn the fancy titles? But the fact is, in the short term, my job is to do as good work as I possibly can now at Collins. When I get off this call, I'll be you know, back in InDesign doing what I do on a daily basis. That said, you know, the long-term ambitions, I think, will show up and become clear to me so long as I keep meeting new people, uh, reading books as I constantly do, um, learning from the mentors I have at Collins. Those things will become apparent, like you mentioned, how many brand strategists have fallen into brand strategy as an example. I think it'll be the same thing in many ways for my career. I'll probably fall into the next opportunity. It might be that one day I meet an amazing designer who we feel like we need to go run a studio together or help, Rob. It, it might be that I end up a management consultant at McKinsey. I have no <laughs> idea. Right? The, the, the possibilities are endless. And uh, it, it's my job just to, to tap on the doors, knock on the doors, see which one's open and, and go through them when they do. Well, I can't wait to see uh, to see where uh, where those different doors lead you, Diego. Thanks so much for making time. Uh, it's been uh, you know really interesting and, and inspiring to hear your story. And um, I wish you the best of luck at Collins. And uh, if you're not there when you're 85, I wish you the best of luck on whatever that next step in your journey is. Thank you, Rob. I really do appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for listening to How Brands Are Built. To learn more about Collins, visit wearecollins.com. You can also learn more about Diego and see some of his work at diegosegura.me. Segura is spelled S-E-G-U-R-A. And Diego's on Twitter at Diego Does. His books, To a Man Much Like Myself and The Dropout Manifesto, are available on Amazon. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I really appreciate it. How Brands Are Built is a production of Heirloom Agency, LLC. Our logo and original podcast artwork is by Joel Sherlow, with additional design work by Lacey Honda. Web development by Matias Garrido. Our theme music is by Isha Erskine Project. If you're still listening, a quick programming note. This was the final interview of season four. I'll be back soon with a wrap-up episode. Until then, I'm Rob Meyerson, and I'll talk to you next time.